Hey, people. Uh, for the first time for this spinoff podcast, Bender and I are both here doing the intro for That Year in Comics. Hello, hello. This episode is going to be 2004, and I think this was one of the... I think so far, the three, this was my most fun. I don't know that it was yeah. the best comics we've read, but it the most fun. It wasn't dark, and it was... Uh, well, we get a little dark with one of the books. One of them, but it wasn't too dark, and it was just, it was just one we both really, really enjoyed. And it's a book you're going to go home and read that you've never read before. So. Yeah, it was uh, infinitely astonishing. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> uh, it was a crisis that you never yeah. read. Uh, all of that said, hey, uh, be sure to check out... Uh, CaveCon in Springfield, Missouri, because more importantly, check out Comic, or I'm sorry, check out the Comic Cave in Springfield, Missouri, and more importantly than that, in September, check out CaveCon, where you'll find at least one of the hosts of this show there. Yeah, I'll have a newborn. I don't know if I I don't think he'll be there, but... uh, Maybe I can dress her up. If you do check it out or you do go in there, you tell the owner, Josh Roberts, that you listen to uh, our show and that that's why you're there because he's a very good friend. I I would go so far as to say a brother of mine. He's a great guy. It's a great... I I want that to be a very big success because we, as we talk about in this episode, with 40 comic conventions in the year 2004, there's just... We need more in Missouri. We need them more. Absolutely, because I've never been to one. And also, while you're there, you can and meet in the uh, CaveCon in uh, September, you can also meet uh, author of Waking the Weaver, a Timberhaven novel, Aaron yep. Conway, who's been on this show. So go do both of those things. And buy his book. Yeah. Support your independent artist. Buy, and the, podcast. buy the damn book. And yeah. go to the shop and buy, buy it from the shop, because I do know that he has hard copies there to purchase at the shop. So Ooh. do that. And then show up and get it autographed in September. Yep. All right. So that's all we've got. This is the uh, That Year in Comics 2004. Yep. Go follow us at PC Bombcast uh, on all the socials and yep. go to PCBombcast.com to follow all things PC Bombcast. And let us know what you like, like, rate, Hashtag TYIC for any year you want us to review in the future. Yeah, absolutely. All right, listen to the show. 1938, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster created Superman, and with him, the superhero genre was born and the comic book industry was kickstarted. Now, I've been a fan of superheroes my whole life, but it wasn't until 1991 when Jim Lee and Chris Claremont relaunched X Men that I became obsessed. And while my obsession has dwindled over the years, this new series from the Pop Culture Bombcast is my way of reconnecting to what made me love comics so much in the first place. And I've brought my co-host and good friend Bender who reconnected with his love of comics through our friendship more than 10 years ago. So join us as we break down the best of what each year in comic book history had to offer as we give you That Year in Comics. Hey, welcome to 2004. 2004. I was waiting on you to chime in. But oh, okay. I didn't nope. know what I was doing. Well, I was waiting on some kind of response, uh, but instead you're just on your phone trying this... to find a comic that wasn't from 2004. No, most you're likely. right. It wasn't. This is uh, this was or the way I like to refer to it, freshman year part two of college. For me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the sequel yeah. to freshman year. Hey, before we jump into 2004, though, uh, like hey, like almost every dead character in the history of comics, we are back. For our third episode. Hells, yeah. I mean, they come back two or three times. We'll leave, that's a little yeah. bit of a foreshadowing for something, buddy, we'll talk about at the end yeah. of this episode. Maybe we'll murder each other at the end of one of these and Bef- then come back the next time. Maybe. Yeah, I don't fun. see that happening. But, hey, any any uh, any thoughts on uh, the previous episode of 1996 before we jump forward in time to 2004 in our DeLorean? No, no. Uh, I, did I liked 86 better than 96. Reading wise, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I thought it was a decent episode. We got some good feedback by one of our uh, our other the normal sponsor of our normal podcast, uh, Rick from uh, the Beer Salt Shop. Yeah, he enjoyed it. He's now following us because he likes the that year in comics stuff. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Let's just stop beating. Oh, around wait, wait. The buck. I do. Uh-oh. I did think of something. Uh-oh. Uh oh, Judo Christian is not a thing. Yeah, it's I, Judeo. I <laughs> uh, Thank you, Dusty, for pointing that out. But it should be. Yeah. Well, I imagine there's judo Christian somewhere. Maybe, like, I feel like that would be um, <clears throat> Chuck Norris's comeback movie. Is like judo, judo Christian. Christian. <laughs> Chuck Norris and Kirk Cameron are <laughs> judo Christians. Yep. We just wrote a comic book. They're, they're out to kick ass in the name of God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna that's happen. Gonna, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, but that said, let's stop getting beating around the bush. Let's jump right into 2004. So let me break down what happened in the world in 2004. All uh, right. First off, one probably the biggest news out of 2004, Facebook was made for co- uh, college students everywhere. Yep. Uh, they had the preliminary hearings for Mr. Saddam Hussein. 
he was being tried for war crimes. Oh, so yeah. those started. Uh, the Indian Ocean earthquake, which was a 9.1 to 9.3 earthquake, which was the largest known tsunami affecting the coastal areas of Thailand, India, Sri Lanka, the Mal- uh, Maldives. How do you say that? Maldives. Yeah, that Maldives. one. Malaysia, Myanmar, and Bangladesh and I think Indonesia. It's Myanmar. I don't think that's it. It is Myanmar. Myanmar? I think so. Mm. I don't know that I should take pronunciation lessons. You probably shouldn't, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on that uh, one. But it killed over a quarter of a million people. Yeah, it's crazy. It is insane. So that was a big one. The year in sports, 2004, summer games were held in Athens, Greece. Yep. Unfortunately, the curse of the Bambino was lifted as the Red Sox won the World Series against our St. Louis Cardinals. You left out uh, Michael Phelps won his first one of eight medals that I'm year. I'm not done. How could you say I left? Well, you out? can't. You, you jumped around. Oh, in Athens. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. So back in Athens, Michael Phelps did he debuted with some gold medalage yeah. there? Yeah, won the most amount of medals in one Olympics. Probably, sadly, the biggest story in, story in sports is uh, Janet Jackson's right nipple made waves by appearing next to Justin Timberlake during the halftime show of the Super Bowl. Yeah, did you see it? I did see it. Like you, like we're actually watching. Oh, even we even went to the interwebs to try to break it down oh, and see what yeah. happened. It was yeah, staged, it. staged event. Oh, I think the whole so thing too. Staged. I mean, that nipple ring was way too cool. Yeah, she to just be that wearing, was, and it wasn't a malfunction. That thing was a peel away spot. Oh yeah, for sure. JT in the heat of the moment is not tearing leather or no. pleather. So, no. uh, in music, Ashley Simpson's was caught lip syncing on SNL and backpedaled out of it in the worst way possible by throwing her band underneath the bus. Oh, I forgot about that. William Hung lost an American Idol, but he won our hearts when he did his rendition of Rich, Ricky Martin's She Bangs, which she bangs. if you know Ricky Martin, she ain't banging nothing there. Uh, then Usher and Little John said, yeah, with Ludacris, enough times to make a number one song for the year. Oh, nice. Yeah, TV and music, we did lose Marlon Brando and Rodney Dangerfield, and only one of them this year has uh, been reportedly had sexual romps with Richard Pryor, and it was not Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, for, although that would have been funny. For, uh, I do, I get no respect <laughs> when I'm fucking you. Hey, Friends came to an end, but House and Lost debuted. The oh, Lord, man, we went to the same website. Lord of the Rings saw The Return of the King come back with an Oscar for Best Picture and some of these movies made names. Shrek 2, Blade Trinity, Anchorman, Napoleon Dynamite, Eternal Sunshine, Garden State, Hellboy, and not to mention maybe two of the greatest comic book inspired movies of all time, Spider-Man 2, which is your favorite, and possibly one of the most underrated superhero flicks ever, The Incredibles. Uh, Is it underrated? I think it's underrated in a term that when people talk about comic book movies, they don't say that it's one of the best. But in terms, it had no nothing. It wasn't based yeah, on anything. But in terms just, of a Disney Pixar movie, I think mm-hmm. it's widely considered one of the greatest. So, yeah, I agree. I yeah. love it. Uh, so that was that was the world. Anything on the world before we jump into the comics? Uh, the only thing that I had was well, I had a couple things. I had uh, you missed Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Came oh, out. I did. I did miss that. And a little movie that I also love uh, called Shaun of the Dead came out. Oh, you know what? I meant to handwrite that in. I wrote, t- typed this up and missed it, and that was a very big one, especially for the yeah. our, our world. Yeah, and then uh, staying in, which I thought was topical, uh, Brie Larson made her film debut in 13 Going on 30, Ryan Reynolds' oh, wife. That's I did somebody, not know right? that was her first, but yeah, that is very timely for Mrs. Larson. Although, uh, although I don't think we're going to see her until 2019, period. So Really? Yeah. And then uh, Megan Fox made her debut, if you're into the Transformers movies. She's not in those anymore, though. Solid right? first move. No, she had that massive falling out with... Yeah. Uh, no, but then she came back for another one, like the third one or something. Yeah, I still don't think they get along. Uh, probably not. Hmm. Uh, in Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, personal favorite of mine, Emily Blunt, in a movie I had never watched called My Summer Love. Didn't know it existed. Hmm. I'm glad you put down movies that have no re- <laughs> pertain to you. I just whatever. really like Emily Blunt, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. And then um, music... Uh, 99 Problems by Jay-Z and yep. uh, American Idiot by Green Day. Yeah, the, I did, uh, I did biggest see that. Albums, yeah, uh, or biggest songs and albums. Yeah, that'd be the Black Album and, and American Idiot. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was the name and of it. And then uh, Ronald Reagan died. That was the only oh, other thing yeah. that I didn't... Uh, that you had that I didn't. Yeah, there you go. Or I had that you didn't. Well, then let's jump right into the comic industry in jump the year right 2004. Uh, we always I always like to start with sales. Thanks to a uh, slew of block, blockbuster runs and some high-profile limited series, 2004 was a very positive year in comics, being up 6% over what was a reported good 2003. 
Oh, yeah? Uh, the top ten comics that year in this particular order from one to ten, Superman, number 204, which was the debut of Jim Lee and Brian Azzarello, Az- Azzarello, came in second. Superman, Batman, number eight, which featured a bunch of great Michael Turner covers, and that was the debut of the new Supergirl. Hmm. Identity Crisis, number one. Well, more on that in a bit. Astonishing X-Men, number one. More on that. Superman 205. This list gets crazy here. Superman, Batman 10. Identity Crisis 2. Superman 206. And Superman, Batman number nine. That is DC dominance right yeah, there. Yeah, no shit. Marvel had two books. And, I mean, it just it's, it's weird how times change. Yeah. Um, no Spider-Man to be seen. You know, yeah. I don't uh, know what he was doing. Some in noted first appearances: uh, the Winter Soldier, Captain America. Uh, Winter Soldier debuted in Captain America number eight. That okay. was Ed Brubaker's run, I yeah, believe. That's a good run. Um, Diodato Junior, I believe, was the art. Maybe I, I didn't write that down. X twenty three made her debut in NYX number three, uh, but technically her first appearance would have been in a cartoon X Men Evolution the year before. Yep, yep. And then Ord, who we'll talk about later in Astonishing X Men number one. Some other notable events of 04, Eric Larson took his turn at CEO of Image. Uh, after 27 years, Dave Sims, Cerebus, the Aardvark, ended its 300-issue run, possibly the greatest independent comic of all time in terms of impact and longevity. Okay. Uh, CrossGen Entertainment announced Chapter 11 bankruptcy, ending its punish- publishing and dissolving some, some pretty underrated lines of comics that came through CrossGen. Uh, and another note on independent, two profile independent comics con this year. Jeff Smith ended his bone after uh, oh, 55 yeah. issues. And then I wrote this down, and I'd like, I wish, I need to start including this. There were 40 major comic conventions this year, major ones, like notable in ones. In 2004? Yeah. Holy and, shit. Including four Wizard Worlds, of which I attended the one in Chicago in this year. Hmm. And I got a little note here just to let people get some of your credibility. How many comic conventions have you attended in your life? Zero. Not very good, Bender. I Not do need good. to go to one. You do. I always invite you, and you never go. It fall, the wizard con always falls on like a soccer tournament yeah. or something. And the fact that you call it wizard con means people are going to lynch you from hang you from their rafters. Wizard world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, notable series in two thousand four. This is some stuff that we're not going to talk about. You know, we always break down a handful of comics at yeah. the end of this. But things that were of note. This was a good year for comic books. Superman had his Godfall run. Superman, Batman. We mentioned. Planetary did its first crossover with Batman in, yeah. cro- in Crossing Worlds. New Avengers debuted. Constantine was still killing it. Runaways, K- Brian K. Vaughn's initial volume, yeah. came to an end. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a good, that's a good solid uh, run. Planetary, Preacher, you had so many stuff. Go- I'm not Preacher. Planetary, uh, I mean, you had so many good comics that were going mm-hmm. on. Uh, not to mention the three that we're going to talk about in detail here. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess we should say this. Uh, the first one I'm going to let you, I'm going to turn over to you. Um, we... We typically, like the last episode, there's no structure format on how we break these down. We did a good, bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Because I thought that year was so notably bad with mm-hmm. the bad ones. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we don't, we ne- we do like to pick like what our favorites are. And I definitely did that with the last two. Yeah. We picked this one because it was timely. And, yep. and you had been in the re- middle of reading it or you'd brought it up anyway. Well, I, we were bouncing around ideas for comics and, uh, I was looking, you know, different years and stuff. And I had, Astonishing, uh, the Astonishing X Men came up, but I know we're not going to talk. Yeah, we're about not it right doing now. that one. But uh, so then I started looking at other stuff that came out that year, and it was the premiere of the one that we are going to talk about right now, and it seemed pretty timely with the movie coming out to March, when Thursday, Friday. I think it's this yeah, Friday. This yeah. Friday, I believe. Probably uh, Thursday, because that's what movies yeah, do. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, by the way, we are talking about the new Deadpool two, and that uh, it's getting reviews saying it's better than the first one. Yeah, I mean it's it holds up. I really didn't have any uh, doubts that it wouldn't be funny or good. Yeah. At least uh, I had zero expectations for the first one and enjoyed it. Uh, so I figured it'd only get better from here. So did you? So that said, our first book we're going to jump into is the initial uh, six to eight issues. You can hit on seven and eight if you want, but the first six they were, were solely in twenty third or two thousand four. Yeah. And seven, seven and eight closed out two thousand four. Did you write down the? Uh, I creators? read. Yes. Uh, so it was written by. A, you you just, want me to read you it? Just want me to read it? No, don't it's you? Nisi Asa. It's Fabian Nisi Asa. Yeah, and then. Uh, Drawn by Mark Brooks and Patrick Zurcher. Yeah, uh, Mark, so Mark Brooks only did the first two books. Yeah, Patrick Zurcher did three through 24, so yes. he stuck around for yeah. a while. Uh, so this ran, uh, I guess, for 40, 44 issues, well, No, I it, it went right to 50. 
I oh, read that. Yeah, it went all the way to oh, fifty and ended. That. Um, which and, is amazing because it's this is not that good. Well, and I and I some things of note for you real quick before you jump into it. Yeah. It was launched in the wake of the cancellation of both characters titles yeah. mm-hmm. and the the best thing about the series and i have cards on the table i've only read it sporadically here and there yeah. the covers by scott young were yeah, unbelievable yeah, so. yeah. i'll give you that but it's, it's just, otherwise if i if i were i read all 12 issues of the first you know the you know as if it and you came could go out all monthly. into 12 if you want yeah. that's fine and i mean it's no big deal but i you know i just assumed it was monthly because i'm getting them in trade form but it's just it it wasn't that great. But I think for those of you who most people know who Deadpool is from the first movie, but there may be some people who don't know who Cable is, uh, or doesn't don't know that much about Cable going in. Do you want to lead into him first, and then if you want, in? go ahead. So I wrote this down because his uh, Com- de- comic convoluted book, convoluted story is pretty insane. He is a telepathic, telekinetic, and technopathic yeah. mutant. Who is the son of Scott Summers Cyclops and Madeline Pryor, Jean Grey's clone? Yes. Who uh, was born with a techno virus, <clears throat> which is basically an alien virus that attached itself to him as an infant. They ship him off to the future to take care of the virus or find a cure in the future. Well, he grows up in an alternate timeline where Charles Xavier, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is killed and Apocalypse takes over. It basically wipes everybody well, out. Well, no, because he did not grow up in the age of apocalypse. The, oh, you're right, the, you're right. Uh, the, See, this is where I kind of got confused. The non-metal arm, Goldeneye, the the one that did not become that. Oh, became Nathan X-Man. Summers or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's... yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, do you remember exactly how he lives in Apocalypse's world or whatever? He grew up in a future where with that, but he did not grow up in the age of apocalypse. That's and right. He was, that's right. And, he and came, that's where I get him confused. Yeah, and he came back in time like he they do but he's all powerful he's got you know the telepath he can talk to machines he's got telekinesis powers and he holds this techno virus which is basically like a uh matrix style metal thing that keeps trying to take over his body cancer style thing he yes. holds it at bay with his psionic powers like his yeah, telekinesis, telekinesis powers style. which is why in the early run of the comics you never see how powerful he yeah. can be because mm. Had he unleashed his powers, then the virus would take him over. Yeah. So he has to keep it at bay constantly. So how does he sleep? I, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know how Black Bolt sleeps, but I like the, the, the reasoning yeah. they make for it before they do him. Yeah, so leading into this, that's I think that's what the, basically was the premise of this. is. So the first first arc of this uh, run is called... Um, it's if called, looks could kill. Yeah, if if looks could kill. And it basically leads off as Deadpool is hired by the One World Church, which is a French church, um, to steal a virus that's going to turn the <laughs> entire world blue. It's going to turn the entire world blue. Blue. Uh, For no reason. No, I mean, they had their reasons. <laughs> just, their reasons yeah. were that, you know, racism and, yeah. you know, gender... Yeah. You, you know, it was it was it was enough. Uh, but wouldn't you be shades of blue? So that would be a problem too. I know everybody was just blue. Oh, you were just gonna be blue. Okay. Everybody was just like super blue. The art is like super goofy comic, you know, care or you know, cartoony for you know, Cable and Deadpool. So, uh, and then Cable is trying to figure out how to use his powers for good because he's came back from the future and this he's time, newly enhanced powers. Yeah. he's got more power. Yeah, he's it. even more powerful now, and he's back from the future, so he knows how the future turns out. That it, you know, it doesn't go well, and so he's like, "How can I change this?" So he's intrigued by this, uh, by this church. Yeah. So Deadpool is hired to steal a virus from the Germans. That is, uh, I, for, I forget the even name of the virus, but anyways, it uh, basically allows allows the church to turn everybody blue, but it's flawed. It is. <laughs> uh, and needless to say, Cable and Deadpool both become infected by this virus. And then Deadpool needs Cable's DNA. De- Cable needs Deadpool's DNA to keep the virus at bay and stop his techno virus as well. So about midway through the comic, uh, uh, Cable ingests Deadpool. Yeah, he absorbs him completely. <laughs> <and then laughs> throws him up. Because Deadpool then, regenerates. Yeah, and then he regenerates, and now Cable is cured. So the first, the whole first story arc is ridiculously stupid. Cable takes the virus that he now has. Well, their DNA is meddled, mixed, yeah, and they mix together. So now Cable fixes the virus as well, turns the whole world pink. Yeah. Instead of blue, 
just because he can, and then says, just kidding, turns everybody back to normal and becomes an all-powerful god. Well, he becomes their savior. Savior, it's what he, yeah. he infects them in order to save them. Yeah, yeah, just so that everybody knows that he's that powerful. But there is a catch. Now De- Cable and Deadpool are linked together genetically. So at the very end, Cable puts together his uh, some spaceship that he had. The Grey it, Malkin. Yeah, the Grey Malkin. And it's got teleportation powers that he uses to jump around. And Deadpool would later use this throughout his entire comic run. So. Yeah. So, but there's a catch to it that since their DNA is linked, anytime Cable teleports, Deadpool and him teleport and combine together and then have to tear each other apart. And then te- Deadpool can also teleport and tear each other apart. Yeah. Which leads into That the, sets up the entire series. Yeah, so. the entire series. So then the second run on this is... Uh, which was 7 through 10, which I guess like, only really counts for 7 and 8. But the, basically, the second part of this is Cable sets out to be a savior for the entire world. Right. Forcing all of all of the world to give up their weapons. And um, he creates that Grey Malkin as a refuge for uh, free thoughts for scientists and philosophers and anybody else who wants to come live there uh, without religious persecution or any of that uh, stuff. So he's... Basically forcing uh, the Gaza Strip to give up weapons and, you know, you know, Iran and Iraq to get along and Islam and all this. Everybody to get along. And it's making all the world powers nervous. Uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. tries to take him out and fails. The X-Men try to take him out and they can't figure out how to do it. And so they hire Deadpool to steal a bunch of... Uh, Technology to create a teleportation to, that'll and, and allow them. And one thing them. we we do miss about Deadpool, or not Deadpool, but Cable, is he's a military genius. Yes. He's a brilliant technician, yeah. even more so than his dad. There's a pretty good setup in here that uh, so Cable, uh, Cyclops, and Wolverine, and the, you know the rest of the X Men are running these uh, these drills, and they keep failing in um, the Danger Room. They keep they keep failing it, and they're on like Ooh, seventy-seven the tries. Room later. Yeah, and they couldn't figure it out. So that's when they finally bring in Deadpool, because Deadpool and him are connected at this point. So they figure if they can convince Deadpool by letting him become an X-Men, which is what Deadpool has always wanted, is right. to be an X-Men. So they're like, well, we'll let him be an X-Men He's if he gets us in there. He's, yeah. yeah. He doesn't have a lot going on. They in just the give him an outfit. He's for, like, okay, I'm in. For having three distinct voices, he doesn't have a lot going on yeah. upstairs. Yeah, no, nothing at all. He's 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 just whatever. Well, anyways, so S.H.I.E.L.D. tries to take him out. The X-Men try to take him out. Deadpool couple, double-crosses the X-Men. And that's when and Cable admits that he actually wanted the X-Men to succeed and take him out so that he would die a savior for the entire world and show the world as a die a martyr and show the world that they could, there is a better way. And it was his way, and he sacrificed his life to make the world a better place by throwing all the ma- weapons of mass destruction into the sun and different things like that. Anyways, it goes sideways, and it kind of gets real gray and stupid, but uh, Silver Surfer shows up, kicks the shit out of uh, Cable, and they fight all across the world, breaking things and putting it back together at the exact same time, which was kind of cool. They really overpower Cable, because Silver Surfer should just be able to snap a finger, uh, call out to the Avengers Infinity War, and erase him. He can just do that. But he was so powerful, and but he was burning out, and he was going to lose his world, so he has, for some reason, Deadpool lobotomize him. And then the last two issues of this that lead all the way through 12 is Deadpool steals a... Techno alien from AIM and Mar- Modoc. Yeah, I- has the Fixer, which is a super cool character from Thunderbolts. I don't know. Have you ever read anything on the Fixer? The uh, super smart guy with all the technology. He's a, yes, he's yeah, a fun character. About, yeah. Has him graft that to Cable and bring Cable back to life in the end. And then there's a fight with some other guy called Agent X for some reason that doesn't really make any sense, who yeah. also might be Deadpool's clone. Yeah, well, it, yeah, he he is. Uh, they they go in a little more into him and other books. Yeah, and stuff. I was trying to read up on him, hey, and it was way, super fucking confusing. I I really want to jump into this because I, I haven't looked this up in a long time. But just in case those that don't know, Modoc is the uh, mental mobile mechanized organism designed only for killing. Just so you know, that's what a Modoc is. It's a giant head with, with little tiny bitty arms, arms and yeah. legs and floats around on a little flying device. So yeah. Modoc is awesome. Yeah, uh, it it got really weird and jumped all over the place by the end. It started out okay, but it 
just felt really heavy handed. The art was kind of dumb, and I don't know. I just think they've done better Deadpool since then, and better Cable. Well, I think the Deadpool series before that, which was uh, drawn by Jeff McGinnis, and I think I can't remember who wrote it. Probably Fabian uh, Nassisi. Also, yeah, I can't remember. I think it was. Uh, I think he he wrote. There's a very comedic one. It yeah. might not have been all him. I don't. Anyway, uh, Jeff Loeb. I think Jeff Loeb wrote some of yeah. it too. So uh, I think Greg Pak did it after him. And that was a great. And it was run. a great series. Yeah, it really That's... started for the first twelve or so issues run. But Deadpool's had a good run. I mean, even Cable's had some good stuff around yeah. here and there. And he's always been important. And like you said, there the we always kind of break down what the impact on their. That they made on the comic and post outside yeah. the comic industry and the video games and stuff, which I think we don't even really need to break it down on this one. There's a movie this freaking weekend yeah. about them. So. Yeah, and I, I, I am kind of curious how they address like how powerful Cable is or isn't in this. Is he does he have the tech, tech telekinesis, telep- telepathy, and technokinesis or whatever? Yeah, the, all those it is. technos made you stumble. You, uh, there was a lot of techno much. words. It's too, uh, and then his like his uh, his brother on the apocalypse side has got even more ridiculous powers. Uh, uh, real quick though, the only other thing that I forgot in two thousand four, and this was a running joke, so I had to look it up through the whole book is Deadpool talks about the Olsen twins constantly, right. and I was like, what in the fuck were the Olsen twins doing? Was in that 2004? when they turned twenty one? They turned eighteen. Oh, turned eighteen. That was it. <laughs> so, okay, that was okay. That. I mean, like. I had to look it up today. I was like, what in the fuck were they doing? Because he talks about them nonstop. You know, that's like a continuing joke through the first 12 issues of an okay book. I would not buy this. Okay, we'll get. let's go ahead and rate and review it. And I read the first six issues back in the way back and maybe sporadic between the next 40 here and there. Yeah. And almost every time I picked it up, it was because... Of Scotty Young's covers, so yeah. that I mean that was ninety nine percent of why I ever picked it up. But wh- I don't like the depiction that uh, I didn't like the actual drawing inside of the book of Deadpool, like without his mask. I thought the guy who did it just made him look like he had um, like dry skin the whole time instead of his like face melting or you know like his skin scabs and all that. It just looked like he had dry skin, like there was no change to it or whatever. And I just thought the characters kind of goofy, but. I would give it a two out of six. Oh, a two? That's going low. Hey, by the way, just so just in case people were left up for grab, when we were talking about the Age of Apocalypse, Nathan, yes. that is in fact Cable, but he goes by Nathan Gray. Yes, he's just well, the it's Age a twin of... brother, or, uh, alternate universe version he's, of himself. Well, but he's, that's who he would have been yes. had the techno yes. virus and all yes. that stuff. Yes. So they're the same guy. So they both at one point, just so we can convolute the story more, mm-hmm. they both exist in the same universe at the same time at some yeah. point. So yeah. just yeah. like, just like uh, Jean Gray's. Uh, clone, clone, yeah. and Scott Summers date again. For yeah, some, that's not fucking weird. No, uh, <laughs> so I think that I probably would go a little heavier. I'd go probably three, two and a half to three. I'll go three because that first six issues were cheesy. I think what that did more than anything is it set up what would be the how the tongue and cheek humor of what Deadpool would be. Somebody yeah. else better just did it. Okay. I, I'll give you that. And I think that the, uh, I think uh, uh, issue seven through 12 were better. I, I thought, uh, the story was overall a little more interesting than the one world church. I just didn't think it yeah. was a very interesting one world church. church has, had come back before again, later for, oh, really? uh, Deadpool, yeah. He fought them back in his next series. Well, he was actually bit. working for him like pretty much all the way to the very end. Like he was all in on like, like you said, he's a very transparent character who is whoever has the best idea, I'm with them. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. somebody else comes along and he's like, Nope, no, nah, I'm with you. The beauty of Deadpool is how simple they yeah. they create the character. Yeah. And and that allows all the comedy, all the bloodbath, all whatever they need. Plus he's got a mutant healing factor more powerful probably than Wolverine, so the one thing that this run did do was it was the first introduction to the fourth wall breaking uh in the intro which is a issue, mainstay now. yeah on issue 11 uh of this series they broke the fourth wall with a little conversation that deadpool initially did and then i think weasel and uh what's the aim guy that's his buddy um, oh i can't remember his name but yeah bob, or bob, something? bob yeah, yeah bob, bob does Agent bob narrates it yeah mm-hmm. narrates it after that and then i think later on they did the dear deadpool where he like answers fan mail or something as himself yeah yeah which is I, which is pretty funny when i, I think, was reading greg pax that was some good stuff well in there. and greg pack not only added all that but they introduced the third voice so yeah. there's his voice that he has that the 
co-characters have. There's yeah. the, his inner monologue, and then there's a, another voice inside it that contradicts his inner monologue. Yeah. So he has three distinct voices in yeah. common. And then he's, like, his, his one voice is explaining what the fourth wall is to car- comic book characters inside of it. It's a whole complicated thing, which is pretty funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so but, I mean, I guess if we have any recommendation at all, I would say maybe pick up the first 12 before the weekend just to familiarize yourself with yeah. how they ended up buddy cop and their their yeah just burn through it lightly and uh, issue seven also was in one of the top 10 buddy co- uh, comics of all time yeah is what they they threw it up in there yeah that was when they when they jumped together and actually started working and they that was when their first body slide went together if they do that in the movie it'd be fucking hilarious yeah I, maybe by the end that would be like a post credit scene or something <laughs> it's gotta be like it, like it's gotta be gross yeah <laughs> but, uh so so let's I guess that that's good enough for D- Cable and Deadpool. I don't know if there's any more we need to say, but let's jump to the next comic. This is the okay. one that you didn't know cuz we, you know, so when we got together, we knew we were going to do the last comic. Okay. Because it, I think it I, I don't know if you agree, but I think it was the best comic of that year. Absolutely. Uh we knew we were going to do this cuz it was timely for what's happening this mm-hmm. weekend with mm-hmm. Cable and Deadpool and I'm going to put this episode out either tonight or tomorrow, probably tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, but this one was, I think, and, and we'll get into why at the end of it, but I think it was a little bit forgotten, but I did Identity Crisis, which... Re- refresh my memory. So Identity Crisis is the seven-issue limited series by Rags Morales and writer Brad Meltzer, Meltzer okay. who at the time was a New York Times best-selling author. It was also inked by Michael Baer, for those that keep scoring inkers at home. Uh, The story adhered to the continuity changes brought on by post-crisis on Infinite Earth and zero-hour stuff. So Wonder Woman was at one time retconned out of the pre-crisis JLA and replaced in story by Black Canary. Later, Infinite Crisis would restore her as a founding member, but... Here's what this was about. I'll, I'll we'll jump into the plot if you don't. Remember. I think you borrowed this from me when you we were neighbors. I believe so. Yes. So but it's been a while. While on stakeout, elongated man. Uh, while on stakeout, elongated man gets notification that his wife Sue Dibney is murdered in their apartment, apparently dying from burns. Uh, the DC superhero community tries. They they rally around, around him, try to find the murderer. Um, with the primary suspect being Dr. Light. And the reason that is is because Green Arrow, reve- Green Arrow reveals to the Flash, and this is the Wally West Flash, and Kyle, uh, Green Lantern, which is Kyle Rayner at the time, that Light once raped Sue Dibney. Oh, uh, heavy. In the JLA satellite. He found his way into the JL- JLA satellite. She was there by herself, and he raped her. To ensure this couldn't happen again, League members at that time, which were Adam, the Ray Palmer Adam, Black Canary, Hawkman, Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, so that's important because that's a, you know, at the time it was Hal Jordan, Mm -hmm. and a very reluctant Flash, which was Barry Allen. They all voted to let Zatanna, who's super powerful, the the woman that says words backwards to make her spells, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to mind wipe Dr. Light. And they essentially reduce him to a drooling moron who becomes the Justice Society and JLA's punching bag for the next 20 years or so in comics. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's further revealed that the mind wipe was also done at least on one other occasion, and that's when the uh, Secret Society of Supervillains, this is the Wizard, Floronic Man, Star Sapphire, Reverse Flash, and Blockbuster, capture JLA members Superman, Batman, Flash, Green Lantern, Hal Jordan again, Zatanna, and Black Canary. Uh, This was... Wonder Woman and Pre-Crisis, but they've yeah. swapped it out, yep. um, mm-hmm. and switched bodies with the heroes. This allowed the villains to learn their secret identities simply just by taking their masks off. Ooh, deep. That's so deep although one. the heroes defeated the villains, they once again came to a vote that Zatanna needed to mind-wipe them because they needed to protect their secret identities and their families. It's a slippery slope they're going down. Well, it gets even worse, like it tends to do. Uh, the heroes now find Light, and Light knowing that the heroes are after him. And again, this is of Dr. Light that poses no threat to anyone. He's just kind of a joke. Okay. But he had enough money that he hired the mercenary Deathstroke. And what's important about that in terms of long term in, in comic books is this, more than anything, reasserts the fact that Deathstroke is a badass. Yeah. And people kind of forget that he preceded Deadpool. Yeah. And his name's Wade Wilson. No, yeah, he's I mean Slade, Slade Wilson or Slade, Slade Simpson or something. So, yeah, something so Wade Wilson. I mean, it's a complete parody of him. Yeah, Rob I mean, Rob Liefeld basically he was he made Fabian, Deathstroke, right? Him and Fabian did yeah, it. Yeah, and, and then when he left, he basically made the exact same character in Marvel. Yeah, just, he 
No, he did not make Deathstroke. So, no. Deathstroke's been around well longer oh, than really? he's been drawn. Yeah. But it was just a ripoff. Of yeah, it. it was a direct ripoff. Uh, so, during the battle, Light is... He gets a he he sees the me, the the battle going mm-hmm. on in front of him, and it refreshes his memory to when he did rape Sue, mm-hmm. and it unlocks his memory. So now he's in control of a hundred percent of his power. So he's back again. Well, he's back to a level that we never knew because as comic, the most meta thing about this is comic fans we've never known him because this is a story that was untold mm-hmm. up till now. Oh, interesting. And he is super powerful, actually, because okay. he makes these hard light constructs. He's got the light of the sun. He can do a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, so, Superman uh, shows up at the end after the battle's cleared, and he questions Wally West, who continues to protect all the heroes and everything they've done. So, uh, Superman was not involved in the He was not life. involved in any of this, but okay. there is a cool little scene in the book to where Green Lantern is talking to... Um, our Green Arrow is talking to Green Lantern and Flash, and they're like, why doesn't Superman know? And he goes, because, son, no matter how powerful you are, sometimes you just don't want to hear the truth. And they're talking within earshot, which Superman should be able to hear them. He's just blocking it out. He's just not paying attention, and yeah. he's just, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, Adam then goes on to find his estranged wife, Jean Loring, hanging from a door. She's blindfolded and gagged, and revi- he gets there just in time to revive her and save her, but she mm-hmm. is she can't tell him who attacked her. It was all a blur. She was hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then death threats are sent to across the thing, so super, targeting Superman's wife, Lois Lane. Okay. Uh, then another big moment. So there was a lot. I mean, there was, this was a and we're, well, we'll get into that in a second. So Flash's rogues gallery plays a big part of this. Okay. Captain Boomerang, who's uh, at the time Digger Harkness, is hired by a third-rate villain called the Calculator on behalf of the real killer of the series. Please tell me that this guy carries a calculator. <laughs> the Calculator? Yeah. He is the, you know who Oracle is for good yeah. guys? Mm-hmm. He's the Oracle for the bad guys. Gotcha. It's gotcha. what they end up turning him into because he calculates everything, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so to assassinate J- Jack Drake, who is the father of Robin at the time, Tim Drake. Okay. Who, by the way, for those that don't know, he's probably the most popular Robin. In fact, he's more, he's even more popular than what Dick Grayson was yeah. as Robin, and he's more of a sleuth and a detective than Batman is. He's mm-hmm. even smarter than Batman when it comes to being a detective. But uh, So Jack, though, finds a gun and a note warning him of the impending attempt on his life, thinking that, and that you'll get to that later. Uh, so Boomerang attacks him, and Boomerang, he shoots Boomerang, but Boomerang it fatally throws a boomerang at him and kills him. So uh, Tim Drake gets there after school and he's confronted by his partner Batman, who confiscates the notes and the th- before the authorities know of it and stuff like that. So now the Robin's dead. His dad's dead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, which plays a lot of for the next few years over in the comic. And we've also got uh, Sue Dibney or Dibney. Uh, during questioning of several villains by the heroes, former league members Firestorm, which is Ronnie Raymond, is stabbed through the chest with the sword of a character called the Shining Knight, uh, or I mean the sword of the Shining Knight, by a villain called the Shadow Thief. Firestorm's nuclear powers reach critical mass, and he detonates in the atmosphere. So he's dead now. Hmm. So this is sort of like uh, got some of the elements of. Uh... The other one with the Kingdom Come, a little yeah, bit, just a little, a little bit. bit. This yeah. is more it, when it, this sounds large in scope, but it's really a personal story, really okay. a much smaller. It just story. feels huge. Wally West questions Green Arrow again after accidentally seeing a snapshot in the green because in the satellite because the satellite records things uh, of the of the satellite and and lights mine. So here's what was different though. So they go back in this issue. This is one of the big reveals, and there's a picture where they're all holding Doctor Light back, mm-hmm. but in the in the real picture, it's Batman they're holding back. So he's not he's not going along with this. So Green Arrow says that he disapproved and nearly attacked the other heroes. He was supposed to be left, but he comes he actually teleports back because he forgot something and he sees what they're doing and he loses his mind. And so they mind wipe Batman. Yep. And he's he's unaware of it. Well, there you go. Uh, Slippery the, slope. So then, the, then at the end of that issue, the autopsy of Sue Dibney's uh, body by Doctor Midnight and Mister Terrific. They find uh, those are two members of the Justice Society. They yep. find that she was actually killed by a little infraction in her brain, which after a microscopic scan turned out to be tiny little footprints in her brain, uh, which Adam's the only person with that kind of technology that they know of. Mm-hmm. So, Dr. Midnight, Mr. Terrific realizes, as does Batman, uh, that she was not murdered. She was not murdered by an assassin as an access to the technology, but she was murdered by someone who had access to the, to the Adams technology. 
Uh, almost simultaneously, the Adam himself, Palmer, learns that Gene is aware that of the note that was sent to Drake, which was supposed to be a secret because Batman got to it before anybody else. Mm-hmm. And he deduces that it's, in fact, his ex-wife who is the killer. Mm. So uh, Lauren claims she did not mean to kill Sue. It was not her intention for Jack Drake to be killed. That's why she left the gun. Yep. Uh, arguing that she sent the note and the gun to protect him. Uh, she also states that she undertook the plan, including faking the attempt on her own life, in order to bring Ray back to her life. She was trying to get her husband back. Gotcha. Palmer claims, you know, it, so fin- way it goes. He finally figures out that maybe she's just insane, and they lock her in Arkham Asylum and keep her under heavy, heavy medication. Uh, in the final scene of the issue with the Justice League, Wally West is awkward in the presence of Batman, who begins to be suspicious of why they're all acting different around him. Mm-hmm. So, aftermath of this, the ramifications of the story are they go for a long way. They hit the Flash, for his Rogues Gallery are blown apart through this whole thing, mm-hmm. and they band together, becoming a great—I mean, a great run for the comic books. For them, uh, there was a countdown to Infinite Crisis, as well as one shot and tie-ins, the OMAC Project, uh, JLA. Then Batman, when he finally remembers everything, he creates Brother MK1 satellite and um, to monitor superhumans, which goes on to be a big part of the Infinite Crisis story. Okay. Uh, Brad Meltzer, Meltzer would go on to write for a few years for DC. He did Green Arrow before this. He did Justice League, which was a, his first his run on Justice League when they relaunched that was awesome. Uh, and then he did Buffy season eight, which was a comic okay. book. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the first, I mean, this book was a uh, was. Here's what I want to talk about. This this book, I think, suffers from a couple of things. It suffers from all these words, crisis. Yep. It suffers from all these multiple relaunches that DC's done over the years. Yep. But this book was, um, you could tell by the top ten, it was a massive hit. Yeah. This book was a massive hit. It was this very small story told about these grandiose characters. Yep. And... It, I don't know, man. It got great reviews. It was give. It was it was a recommended reading to a lot of young adults because of the the heavy handed rape yeah. being a part of it. it was, that's that, that scene in that book, and I've got it over there. If you've never looked at it, that it, I gotta be honest, I don't think I read this. It's grotesque I mean, seeing Doctor Light because he is like overtaken with his desires to get back to her, and hmm. they are yeah. It's it's just a little weird. He right, even tells him, it, "I'm going to do it again." Though. He's like, "I'm going to do this again." You know, and that's why they mind wipe him. He goes, I'll ever get to every one of them if I can. That's interesting that w- what I'm taking out of this is like they mind wipe him, but they've never mind wiped the Joker or, you know, somebody who's right. just equally as well, evil. You also, well, that's the thing too. And you have to remember that the, the flashback to the mind wiping and stuff was like a long time ago. Yeah. yeah and it yeah. was, Zatanna was pretty new. And then they come to terms with maybe what they're doing is wrong. Mm-hmm. So, because they are good guys, in fact, but they're. Yeah. Yeah, and then you also have to think too. Why can't they just do that to a lot of people and create an end of villainy? You yeah. Know? <laughs> but, oh yeah, absolutely. But I mean, uh, I don't. I was never big into DC and just. But my my son and I do watch that Flash show. Um, the CW show. Yeah, and it's very good. And what I do like that uh, DC does, and I think that Marvel could take a cue from, is when they go back and they. They do these things where they go back in time and they change something or they retcon something. There's always a consequence that comes from it. Like, it's never a clean, okay, everything's happy now. Right, if you, you go know, back and you save somebody, there's that's just the somebody way the, else that's that's just the sacrifice. way the pop culture world works. No, but I, I just think that DC does a better job they of do. that. Yeah, they do. I think you're right with that. They do. Uh, or at least pretending that it's, it's heavier handed. That said, DC's probably got a bigger problem with its time it's history than Marvel does because they keep doing all these crises and yeah, they need to find another word like, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. like Well, it's not like Marvel's not without sin. All these infinity yeah, wars, yeah, they had yeah. infinity war, infinity gauntlet, yeah. infinite. I mean, it's, it, it is super confusing when you're trying to just, it's a, mu- it's a bit much, but yeah. I get why they do it. I think, uh, and we've just seen it peak. I mean, there, it gets no bigger than the biggest movie almost of all time. So, yeah. um, which, Worked, by the way. I know, saying. I know you haven't you haven't read it, but I'll go ahead and give my rate and recommending, and it's a kind of a twofold rating. I definitely uh-huh. would recommend it. It, uh, it it started. There was a good four years where everything that that happened in this really fueled the DC universe. Okay. Uh, I, at the time, it was a six. Now I think it's about a four and a half for okay. me. Okay. 
and I think that and, and that's not to say the story it, like going back and revisiting the story it got less it's just that it doesn't matter anymore because yeah, of what all changed everything new else. 52 and but, new, new 52 and the other 52 like new coke yeah, and new old number coke. one or whatever yeah. but I, I I will say that uh, it sounds very interesting and I do want to read it and I think that uh, it's kind of fun. So you to, have a six on the anticipation scale. Yeah, yeah, and I will try to read it before the next one. If not, then I will definitely yeah, have it done do, before we'll the do next that. one. Do before we do the next one, and then when we revisit 2004, yeah. you can give us your then thoughts I, yeah, on that. Yeah, I think that'll be fun. It's a good idea. Yeah, we just invented a new segment. Yeah, for, so we'll do that. If we ever bring up a comic that the other one hasn't really read, yeah. we'll go back and read it, and then we'll give our thoughts on it at the beginning of the next episode. Absolutely. Look at what we do, man. We're just inventing we good are, fucking... Podcasting Good, right yeah. here. I was snapping. You couldn't hear that. Yeah, uh, I think they could hear. It. But let's snap onto the next title, huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah I like it. Uh, I think hands down. I got a feeling. I know what we're going to rate this, but I think this was the best comic book, at least the best mainstream comic book of the year. And I'll get into how much I liked it at the end of it. But this would be Astonishing X Men Volume One, yep. r- written by one Joss Whedon of Buffy and Serenity Firefly fame. Art, by, uh, uh, more important, and Avengers fame. Avengers and, and lesser known Universe. Dollhouse, which I did not like. People did. I yeah. didn't. And now DC Universe, he's over there. Yeah. Uh, and Art by John Cassidy. And let me just say this. And this is going to be a big boast for me. Okay. Um, I think Jim Lee is the greatest comic book artist I've ever seen. Okay. But I think John Cassidy's run on Planetary, but more importantly, this X Men. Maybe the best looking comic I've ever seen. It is very gorgeous. I think it's even better. I'm, as much as I love Jim Lee and trust me, Hush and all that mm-hmm. stuff is great. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying Cassidy's a better artist. I'm not saying it's you know it's apples to oranges. No, it's just very clean. It's just amazing. Yeah, every 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 it's every a, and it tells pretty. a story amazing. Yeah. So that said, it's we, the emotion that he captures in their faces. We're kind of breaking our rule here. We're going to get into the first two arcs, and one of the reasons I'm justifying the twelve issues is because this was badly late so it went into 2005 pretty deep but if you look at the art and like how deep the story is it kind of makes sense and he was also drawing planetary to time and then he had to come over and draw another book i forgot to write down what that book was but Mm -hmm. so he was busy um so the first six issues of this series gifted which is like i just said one through six yeah focuses mainly on the introduction of several key characters um also introduced is a mutant cure designed by the Indian Benetech scientist, Dr. Kavita Rao, or Hayo, I don't know how you pronounce it. Who yeah, is, Rao. I would yeah, Rao. Rao. Yeah, who was secretly sponsored by the uh, a person we mentioned earlier, a warrior alien named Ord. Uh, the prospect of a re- – and so this was a real uh, cure for a mutant cure. So the prospect of having real humanity captures the attention of the heavily mutated beast at this time. He's so if you don't know, he was a cat at this time, thanks to Warren Ellis's run on New yes. X Men, uh, which came to an end in two thousand four. If we didn't which, mention that already, uh, which speak, speaking on that, he I didn't I didn't dive too much into it, and I still really have never done more research into it. Uh, he has multiple mutation. <laughs> Levels and he's actually mutating backwards, becoming more feral. And yeah, he was yeah. afraid that well, he was mutating well, backwards. Well, Warren Ellis uh, introduced in New X Men, which came to an end in two thousand four, was secondary mutations. That yes. even there was mutations among mutants. Mm-hmm. He was the first, and his was probably the most pronounced of what we saw because he became like a cat, which he couldn't like really use his hands like he had to. And yeah. He was getting more feral looking, and mm-hmm. he was getting more feral in actions from time to time. He's still brilliant. Yes, but, but he would uh, slip away. Yeah, um, and he was worried that eventually it would take completely over. Yes. So he saw this as an opportunity, to, so he went to go visit the, uh, Dr. Rao, only to discover that the drug is, pr- is a product of illegal human experimentation on an unknown victim. So he, of course, does what he's supposed to do. He alerts the X-Men, and they yes. raid uh, Benetech, and... Lo and behold, like the intro to our episode and how comics don't, our characters don't stay dead, mm-hmm. they reunite and free Colossus. Yes. Who has been dead at this point since 2001, yep. thanks to sacrificing himself to cure the legacy virus. Yes. And save his sister. Yes. Um, with Colossus's help, the team take down Ord, who's a badass on it. There is an amazing, speaking of the art, amazing fastball special yeah. in it. Um, Couple fastball specials throughout the series, though. But the big, this one's a big one. Yeah, this yeah, is the yeah, one yeah. where they look at each other and wink, and he goes, yeah. and he just throws him yeah. without even saying it, yeah. and it's just great. 
Uh, it, but it's they beat Ord, but not before it's revealed that Ord, his plan was to take down the X Men because in his planet is prophesized that an X Man would destroy his home planet, the Break World, within the next three years. Yes, which um, you would think, hey, that uh, sets up the next story arc. But it doesn't. It does not. No. Uh, and instead, the next story arc is Dangerous, which goes through 7 through 12, and it features a sentinel attack with a mystery mastermind. Mm-hmm. Uh, the culprit turns out to be the Danger Room itself, yep. which is becoming sentient and appears... Sentient. Sentient, yeah. And appears as a robot called Danger. Now, here's where it gets ugly, and the X-Men get really pissed at Professor X because, as we mentioned in uh, the last episode, Professor yeah. X is not without his demons. No, he's kind of a dick. He's imprisoned Danger and made Danger an unwilling host of the Danger Room, leaving the X-Men disgusted because he knew that there was actual humanity yes. inside this robot. Uh, but And by the end of this uh, 12 issues, I know we didn't break it down like we did before, but there's a lot. I really want you to go read it. But by the end of this, it's revealed that Emma Frost is still aligned with the newly formed Hellfire Club. Yes. Um, that gets complicated there's, later. There's a lot of fantastic stuff in this yes. with Wolverine being... Wolverine. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, like I said, they're... they're so, uh, what I got out of this, essentially, I would say is uh, Scott and Emma are together after Jean has died for, I don't know, the 47th for time For the umpteenth time, yeah. yeah. Wolverine's not happy about it. Uh, Emma Frost is the, the good guy now who's there, but she still can't shake her bad guy... Mo in the well, beginning. Well, she can't shake. She's a bad girl at heart, and I yeah. don't mean a bad a villain. I just mean she's a she's the she's the the she's not a superhero. Well, what she is is the uh, Regina George of her school. Yeah, yeah, she's the mean girl. She's yeah. the Lindsay Lohan mm-hmm. or not Lindsay Lohan, but uh, what's the other chick from that movie who plays the Regina George? Oh uh, yeah. shit, I know that girl. Yep. Yeah. Anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, so Kitty Pride comes in, and she is the good girl of the school, and. Yeah, she you comes know, in to be the assistant headmaster. Yeah, and she, you know, and I, the things that this story arc does is it really gives a lot of power to Kitty Pride. Well, Kitty, for those that don't know and aren't familiar with the character, Kitty really came to prominence in the '80s with under she became Days of Future Past. Yeah, well, she and she was Wolverine's right hand man, yeah, so to yeah. speak. He teaches her mar- He takes her with her to Japan. She learns martial arts. Her yeah. powers are pretty impressive when she when she yeah. gets fully control of them. She would later be replaced by Jubilee when Kitty kind of leaves the X Men. Yeah, Jubilee was a product of the nineties. <laughs> yeah, she was the Asian girl that dressed all lit in a permanent uh, yeah yellow raincoat. and pink yeah and raincoat all that stuff yeah. Blue high tops and all that. And she had uh, a light. She had a light show as her powers. But uh, what it does, what this story arc does for me is it. In the X, they could learn from this again. Is it contained itself? It stayed within <laughs> its wheelhouse. That's a good thing that you brought up because me. So my close friends, Dwayne, and all of us that have read comic for years, and I think you and I have really talked about it too, is what comics don't do anymore, and more so even now than ever, as we get. We're, we're main event after main event after crossover event after epic event. And there was a lot of epic stuff going on in Marvel and DC at the time. But this story was just this story. Yeah. They even had to come out and say, well, it exists on its own separate. It's a different story. But that's just it. It was it was so, so good. And it, and it yeah, and it, it was so good it didn't have to overlap anything. And it, it didn't bring in too many characters. It was... Only Cyclops and Emma's the leaders, and then Beast, Wolverine, Kitty Pride, her dragon Lockheed, and uh, Colossus. For the most part, it had uh, it brought a little bit of Nick Fury, the old Nick Fury, uh, pre Sam Jackson Nick Fury in there. Well, that the the second story arc does that. No, no, no. He's in the first one. What's he? with Ord of Brick World? Well, see, they don't go to Break World until the second. No, they don't. But they. But that's when I mean. Yeah, oh, they, they turn Brand, him over. They yeah, turn they him, turn him over. over to Abigail yeah, and you Brand. learn about what is the name of it? It's not Sword. Sword, which is the space version of, of Shield. Shield. Yeah, yeah. Sword. which is Abigail Brand, which is like which a is, Sword and Shield is a clever play. Yeah, it's I mean, pretty that's, fucking good. Yeah, uh, it's Stan. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, strategic World something. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh Sentient World Observation and Response Department. That's it. I that's mean, that's pretty what it is. fucking good. Uh, 
but it it just does such a good job like of capturing like Ord is a badass like he's a total badass but he's also a goofball idiot which is you kind of see Josh Whedon's like comedy there like he's supposed to be the biggest bad dude in his planet but he he loses in the dumbest ways you know like He's so powerful and strong and has everything planned out, but then he, like, trips and falls, you know, type situation. Like, he just loses in the yeah, goofy ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it catches him up. Like, he's expecting to go toe-to-toe with Colossus and Cyclops, but Kitty Pryde just, like, trips him. And it's, all, you know, like, funny shit like that. No, oh, it's it's Joss Whedon. Yeah, humor and it works. And it works on every level. And I can't I loved wait. It. I can't wait till we get to the year where we break down seven through twenty four and the giant okay. size astonishing X Men. Yes, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. my as much as I love this, yeah, I think there's more moments, especially when Cassandra Nova comes back. And yeah. by the way, that those that don't know the the popularity of Negasonic Teenage Warhead is from this. From this, yeah, yeah. She's a member of the Hellfire Club. Yeah, and now she's you know pretty popular in movies yeah. now, but. I I want to get in before we re- let's talk about the reception of this and the claim. Well, we didn't really talk about danger or going to. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just I, I thought that was a pretty interesting and it. I it, the, the other clever. second half, it's, it's very clever, and it, she goes on to be a good guy, I believe. She, yeah, well, point. she goes on with them. Yeah. So in, in this run, in yeah. Whedon's run, and it's one of those things to where. You always wonder how no one had ever thought of this before. Yeah. When they thought of, for instance, I think the biggest, I think in the history of my reading comics, I think one of the biggest aha things I thought, mm-hmm. well, how did we miss that? Was uh, Thirty Days of Night. Yeah. When the guy, somebody simply come up with the idea of like, well, hey, if it's dark for so long in a, a, a Alaska, why can't we just have vampires, vampires all migrate yeah, there? Yeah, genius. Yeah, and and I love that movie, by the way. Oh. It, it's underrated. The series of comic books great. Yeah, it's underrated. Uh, Barry, Barry Templesmith and uh, I know, Stephen Josh Niles, Hartnett's I think, it. wrote yeah. it, the book. I can't remember who wrote the comic. I think that's who wrote Stephen Niles, I think, wrote it. Uh, I like the movie more than the book. Uh, well, I get it, because the book reads like it's going to be a movie. Yep. So so that said, um, this is another one. Like, well, let's, the Danger Room had been training the X Men to get better all this time. Yeah, why wouldn't it know how to kick their AI. ass? Absolutely. It already it's learned it over the years. Yeah. So that's one of those that's one of those no brainer where you feel dumb for not having thought of it before. Him. Yeah, and we should mention that this was the inspiration for the terrible. Or was oh, I, I was about to mention that. So last the, the first six was the inspiration for the X Men: The Last Stand, which is the all all time worst X Men movie. Is it worse than Apocalypse though? Oh, I forgot Apocalypse. I blocked it, it out. Was it was up until Apocalypse. It had a ten-year reign of being the worst X-Men yeah. movie until. Congratulations! Apocalypse. They had a two-for-one thing going on, like where two were good, one was bad. Two were good, one was bad, and then Apocalypse came and ruined it. Yeah, and thank God that we had. How did Apocalypse even get made when we had two good X-Men films? You know what I mean? I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's absurd. We had we had First Class and Days of Future Past, yeah. which were decent movies, very good movies. Yeah, they were. And then how does Oscar Isaac go from Poe Derham to Apocalypse? Dameroon in the... Po, yeah, Dameroon. Is it Dameroon or Dameroon? Uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't I, matter. Uh, how does he go from po, like a charismatic, great character to looking wooden and stupid? I think we're both retarded. I think it's Poe Dameron. 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 Yeah, but yeah, and and well, more important than that, I think before he was Poe, he was awesome in that uh, uh, Machina, ex Machina, ex Machina, Machina. Machina. Yeah, either I, I say it wrong all the yeah. time. Which we, we he was brilliant in. Yeah, that. And, and he's been brilliant in being Llewellyn Davis. He was brilliant in that. So, yeah. and then he was awful, and it wasn't his fault. You can only work with the. Yeah, the material and, and the everyone thought was it was going to be good because Brian Singer came back yeah. for it. But nope, it's not. Well, change. then, uh, and then my I knew it was going to be bad when a cosplayer came out as a dressed as Apocalypse, and he did a way better job yeah. in the makeup. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, it's going to suck. So let's more on the what you you know its its reception and acclaim and its uh, influence. Uh, Gifted was critically praised and won the 2000, 2006 Will Eisner Award for best continuing series because that was at the end of his run was 06. Yes. Uh, IGN called it the best X-Men run in a decade and said Whedon created flawless character dynamics between the X-Men. And I want to tell you that I want to go so far as I think it's the single greatest run X-Men's ever had. 
And I know that's saying a lot. There's days in future past. There's there's a lot of Hellfire Club stuff. And there's some great moments in all those books. I've went back. I've read them. I read them yeah. when I first got into comics in '92 and before. But this is more enjoyable overall. I agree because it's so. It's just so clean. It's an easy story to follow. There's no ridiculous. Like Colossus coming back is the biggest like it oh was, hey well, and it worked and I so I worked at a comic book store at the time I was a manager of a comic yeah. book store at the time I did, didn't yet own my own but that was such a shock that no one knew that was going to happen and then the they had a one in two hundred and fifty variant or twenty five variant I don't know and it was Colossus yeah and no one even knew that that was the variant cover until that day and it instantly and this was in the Still, in the infancy of social media that we yeah. have now, mm-hmm. we just mentioned Facebook wasn't even a real thing for the world. Just college, yeah, it just got out. People were calling like, "Hey, did you get your books in yet?" No, I, well, yes, but I haven't opened them. You got to go. Don't look at the variant; it's going to ruin it. I'm like, yeah. "What?" So oh, you yeah, go yeah, to look yeah. at it, you're like, "It's fucking Colossus!" Yeah. Like, I mean, it was amazing at yeah. the time. That's awesome. Uh, initially contracted for just twelve issues, uh, Whedon decided to stay on through twenty four issues plus the special giant size astonishing. X Men number one, in part in theory because he was upset, he was he was sorry for how delayed it was going to be. Yeah, and that he also knew he had some more story to tell. But the funny note about that, he got so excited by the second half of his story, he contradicted the timeline he created in the first half of his story. Oh, yeah. here and there, he kind of fucked things up a little bit. That's all right. You get a little, you get a little overzealous. That's yeah. okay though. Um, so you forgive him because the story's overall fun. That said, let's let's go ahead and rate and recommend it to people. I'm going to give it a six, honestly. It's we, a hard six. It may be a seven. Yeah. We, I mean, it may be, of all the comics we've evaluated on here, it may be a close third to Dark Knight and Watchmen. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, I think it's the third best comic we've reviewed so far. Or we've, I think so. We've recapped. I, review's not the right word. Recapped for yes. people. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I agree. And I think going all the way through like i we only had you know we said we were going to only read the first you know 12 issues of this but i've already downloaded it's hard the to put them down. volume 3 cuz i have to finish it again cuz it's that good you just and it ends in true weed and fashion on a real cliffhanger like you have to get pick up oh, the next yeah. issue and we're we, you know what and the 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 thing i love about this show that we've come up with yeah. is you and i just sitting for an hour plus talking about comics yeah we said it was gonna be 30 minutes that was a, that yeah was that a was lot. kind of our idea but you know we never do anything what short I, what i don't like about it is this book here is because i wanted we were just doing the first 12 issues yeah. because it essentially took place mostly in 2004 I, I mean, I want to talk about it now but we can't we got to save it to when 2006 or 2000 yeah what well, we should wrap it up in like whatever year that 2006 was. you just yeah. got to hold and so and, and by we'll all means stuff. read ahead yeah and then we'll and when we eventually get to it and and tweet us yeah say i want to tyc yeah, the 2006. ending is so good that i just i just want to get to the end it's a hard six we recommend it i i've probably myself read it 10 times in my since, really since it came out I, this is my third time from being hard covers and stuff like that and when it was on digital and hoopla yeah. and all that stuff i mean you just can't i mean it's worth a look if even if you only like art if you're not into com reading the art's unbelievable if you're not into art but the reading is unbelievable yeah. it's got everything I, you want if you like joss whedon if you liked some of the x-men movies you'll love this book because it's it's everything you want in x-men wolverine cinematic being wolverine is, it's very cinematic in scope yeah uh, your biggest complaint is scott's kind of a downer but he's always been kind of a downer yeah but that's just it and that's what i don't want to ruin it but he's a downer but then in the second story arc when yeah. they get to the break world it's all for a reason yeah it's i, I mean it's it's and emma is great. i would i would almost go so far as say is and and i'm i'm josh roberts uh sponsor of this uh, version of our podcast and the cave comic uh the comic cave in springfield and cave con coming up in september he always says he's the one that told me that i'm most given to hyperbole he's the one that yeah you think everything's the greatest uh so i'm gonna boast something here without having thought about the repercussions of what i'm about to say but it may be the best transition of movie to comic yeah of any person that's ever done it and there's been a few Okay. I, I I mean I don't I can't I can't off the top of my head argue with you. So I'm gonna go to, with I agree. We may with have you. to research it and follow yeah. up on that too and see what others have done. At least bring up others that have made the move. Hey, from what I read, people were nervous about Whedon doing this. 
Oh, I could, I, I could imagine. Yeah, I mean, and uh, he pulled it off flawlessly. Hey, he's always done quirky sci-fi or Buffy or yeah. things like that, and he took on a mainstream comic and he fucking hit a grand slam, man. Yeah. Uh, so hard six, uh, and I think, I mean, I mean, we're at an hour, so that's about what we have. Any other parting shots on two thousand four that we didn't talk about? I... Any comics that you can think of? No, honestly, I that was the, everything that I wanted to touch on was here in this. Uh, other than that, I couldn't think of anything great. I do want to go back and read Identity. Infinite, cr- I see it. On, Identity Crisis. Or I see it on the second shelf. Crisis up. of Inf- it's Infinite Identity Earth. Identity Crisis. Or, <laughs> There's too many crises. So. <laughs> uh, and and we'll, I'll let you have that hardcover to take home and read. And I, yeah, I can't think of anything else. I would like somebody else to tell us what year they want. Yeah, would I would. Re- that if I had one, com- no, not a complaint. If I had one urge of the people listening, and I, we've had have some. Let's have Nerdcon. Uh, well, what's we, his name from Nerdcon or Nerdcast? The- Nerdcast. Jay, Jay. Uh, so we have had a good amount of people suggest. Most of the suggestions have been like 1963, which is Marvel, you Ooh. know, and things like that. And we will do that stuff. Yeah. We'll do like special episodes of that yeah. where we break down the first appearances of those and what else. Was we going should on. just do like one episode then, and then talk about how like goofy and how it doesn't hold we, up. And we've We've also had some some people have suggested maybe doing a uh, best of theme of not a year but like uh, the best uh, b- like the best resurrections of a character. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That. Mm-hmm. And I do want to keep with the that year in comics theme and at least lot, for ten episodes. And a lot of people have said no, you got to do that ninety two with image and stuff. But the, here's the thing: there's a lot of major big years and big events, and we'll get to them. But there's we yeah. want to sandwich it between. All these stuff that you may not. The idea of this is to maybe turn you on to something you didn't know happened or yeah. you might not otherwise think of. And we need your suggestions. If there's, I don't care why you want to pick a year, but if, think of a comic that maybe you like that no one else likes. Yeah. Go back and look and see what year that is. Yeah, you only have to pick one. We'll tweet do the research year. around yeah. it. Yeah, you just tell us. Just tweet at PC Bombcast and tweet that hashtag TYIC. And then the year you want us to do. Yeah. If we get hell, if we do one, that'll be the next episode. But just know we're not doing the big ones yet. We're not. We're gonna. We're gonna space them out. Yeah. We're gonna get my next excited like the one I'm. I'm. I'm I go from six to midnight on is ninety two because of Image Comics. Okay. And being the first real year of me being into comic books. You know? I don't think anybody should say six to midnight. It, it brings up. Weird images that you don't want. Well, I'll pop a boner when I think of that here. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm just beating around just the bush, saying. so to speak. Yeah. And uh, so that said, I think we're done. Tweet we... us. Tweet us. Tweet us, yeah, people. Absolutely. If you like this, tweet us. And I know you like it because it's the two most downloaded episodes we've had in the last 30 Which episodes. Which just goes to show time that I am the true number two. <laughs> just <done. laughs> That said, tell them bye, John. Uh, hold on to your butts, guys. And we're going to play a music here. Very epic music. So... 